think we'd better start. Uh, then people will know that we have something to come to, right? Um, so uh, we have a very small group right now uh, with Lori and Mauricio. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I'm Gloria Pryhuber. I'm moderator for this uh, session. Um, we have three other sessions to this breakout, uh, to this uh, topic. Uh, and our KI um, person is jumping uh, to those others to give us an idea of whether we should join them or whether we should stay here um, at, at the moment. I'm presuming, Mauricio and Lori, that you uh, have a particular interest in this breakout, um, this subtopic. So um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Gloria Pryhuber. I am part of um, both the lung map as the human tissue core um, and the hub map as part of the UCSD uh, lung uh, tissue provider. Um, and I've been part of the policy working group uh, for the hub map. Um, I'm at the University of Rochester. I'm actually a neonatologist, um, but I've done a number of observational uh, studies. Okay. Um, I'm getting a prompt here that uh, they're suggesting group two join group one. Three is in good shape, so. Right, I just, I, I just joined you from uh, the B session. Great, okay, thank you. All right. Good. All right. <laughs> Um, we'll give just a minute or two then maybe um, for people to join us from two. Um, was that you, Chris, that joined from two? Yes, there were, were there... just two of us in there. <laughs> She'll just be two? here in a moment, the other person. Okay. All right. All right, sorry to hold us up here for, uh, yeah. for a minute. So you mentioned that you're with HubMap too? Uh, yes, so I've been with the lung map for the last now six years and then uh, with the hub map for the last, what, year, year and a half that we've been uh, working. Um, so I'm just joining Niels Gellenborg's group at, the, at Harvard Medical School um, the, as the senior data curator. Great. Okay. For hub map. That's great. Uh, yeah. And that's Chris, right? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, why don't we go through actually and introduce ourselves? I think we may have the, uh, the uh, majority of the group here now. Okay, I can start. Yes. Uh, my name is Maurice Rojas, I'm from Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm uh, the head of the biobank, the lawn tissue biobank. We collect, we've been collecting for the last four or five years sample explanted loan samples and normal loans. At uh, the moment we have close to a little bit more than 700 samples. Uh, every time that we, we have a tissue, I mean, we go first to the OR, we collect the samples there. Uh, we initiate, uh, that's where we initiate the whole processing of the sample. Uh, we collect, uh, we, froze, we do flash frozen of a piece, then we do a, a, a cell dissociation. We have hundreds of tubes of frozen cell suspensions that we even have tried. We have done single cell RNA seq of those, and that those, those work very well. We also have a, a, a OCTs, and 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 in addition of that, we try to keep a really kind of good. Uh, uh, record of, of for the patient and and we work very close with our uh, organ provider for the loan transplant program and every time that is a loan that is declined comes to us we have the whole loan and uh, from there we collect airway uh, samples upper airway lower airways and brain and like i said we have close to 700 and we've been very active collecting those samples and and uh, thanks to that, we, we got involved in the loan aging consortium. We have a loan from, it goes from 17 to 80, 95, 85. And uh, that's where we're working right now, trying to identify changes in cells, 
uh, populations and uh, phenotypes in, in, in the lungs from, uh, associated with age. And I think with the COVID-19, COVID-19 is, is quite relevant when we see changes in, in, in the, the target population of, of the virus. And, and that's where we are. That's why we are so interested about this group. Mauricio, will you be able to collect COVID-19 positives? We are collecting, but we don't know how to process the samples. I mean, we've been working very close to see how we can inactivate the virus, for example, if we want to collect, uh, do single cell RNA seq for example. And uh, we don't know. The samples are being collected, but right now they are centralized in, in, in one in, in a biobank, but nobody is touching the samples right now. Yeah. Eventually, yes, we want it. And we initiate collaborations with other institutions and around the world to try to, to coordinate, for example, with a group in Barcelona uh, to have access to those samples also. But, uh, and, and work as a, as a, as a team also in, in the processing of, of those samples. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, before we go on introducing ourselves, uh, let me know that I think everybody uh, has joined us for the group. Uh, just a couple of ground rules here. So um, hopefully none of us are passive observers, honestly. Um, but if you are, um, you can mute and turn off your camera. Um, uh, I would like to have uh, two people um, volunteer to act as scribes to be able uh, to be sure that we fill in um, our, our uh, we record our ideas. It's not filling in the boxes, it's really recording the ideas, right? Um, so in those green boxes, hopefully everyone has um, opened up the Google Doc. It now has both subtopic one and subtopic two in it. Um, so we can move from one to the other. Um, and I'll also say, uh, uh, in addition to the two scribes, think about who you are, um, but anyone can add to those documents, okay? Um, please write your ideas in, uh, really no matter how well developed they are, um, and we can pick up on them um, yeah, and modify them later. Okay, um, so I, I guess just to again introduce ourselves, the. Uh, Subtopic one is our biospecimen access to enable joint analysis. And then subtopic two is the sharing of protocols and how that should be uh, and can be done. Um, our discussion prompts for one uh, is should we, is it desirable to make bio, physical biospecimens uh, biobanked together? Um, uh, would a cross consortial biobank be physical or virtual? Um, how will biospecimen data be captured and shared? Um, and then uh, it was suggested that the libraries formed for single cell and single nuclear RNA seq, uh, for example, might be considered as biospecimens that could also be shared uh, for further uh, analysis. Okay, um, and then uh, we'll get to the protocols uh, in a in, uh, We'll try to use like half our time to do that, if that's all right. Um, okay, um, so Maurizio introduced himself and what he's been doing. Uh, can I ask others uh, to do the same? Yeah, I'll go quick. Uh, I'm Mark Kalishka, I'm at Johns Hopkins University. I'm a cardiovascular pathologist and uh, not a biobanker, but involved in tissues and the process is there. Are, are you involved in a biobank uh, that is collecting tissues? Or? No, but I've been involved in collecting some tissues for the uh, one of the heart atlases for yep. HCA. Yep. Um, my name is Lori Coburn. I'm at Vanderbilt um, and I'm part of the uh, Gut Cell Atlas um, initiative through the Helmsley Charitable Trust. Uh, I'm also involved, I'm an adult gastroenterologist, so I'm helping to get the, the specimens for that project. Um, so not really a biobank, though there is a plan with that to share between the, the sites uh, of their projects. And so I was hoping to learn more about how others are doing that as we don't really have a plan. So mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of experience with doing it. I was hoping to learn uh, mm -hmm. from this group. Mm -hmm.
Uh, and Chris, we heard from, and Sharmista, I think, is our other moderator. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, this is uh, Sharmista Ghoshan again. I also go by Sharmi. Um, nice to meet you all digitally. And um, I am a program director of uh, the National Cancer Institute, and I'm involved in a... I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm involved in a number of uh, cancer biomarkers related programs and uh, one of the programs that's relevant to this uh, meeting is the Human Tumor Atlas Network. So I'm part of that network and uh, I'm a molecular biologist by training. Uh, so I'm here to primarily learn from you all. Thank you. And I can be one of the scribes if, if you need me to. Great. Um, do I have another scribe? Do we have another scribe? So they suggested if no one steps right, up I'll, to go. I'll be, although my internet's been a little flaky, it just fell off, but I'll, I'll try and be the second scribe. All right. Thank you're, you, Mark. You're in charge, though. I'll, I'll back you up. Okay. <laughs> All right. As we said, anybody can add uh, to that. Um, also remember that you can unmute yourself uh, with your space bar. Um, okay. <laughs> Use your space bar. Uh, let's tackle the first subtopic. So uh, biospecimen access to enable joint analysis. Uh, does anyone have ideas about what that means what uh, what its value might be and how we might go about it. Do you want to kind of start the discussion? I mean, we, we're in favor of that. We think it's, it's really important to share. But the biggest problem that we have is, I can say these legal barriers that we have in our institutions. I mean, MTAs and all of that, I don't know how we can go and share a biospecimen that we have with, I mean, we are hundreds of investigators or 10 or 20 groups. Uh, legally, how that can be done. We do a, 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 a basis of group by group, but I don't know if we go and, and as a part of the consortium, how we can handle that. And, and and I think it, it, it this is a it's important to share after you we come and uh, unify protocols and uh, but it, there are some legal issues that we need to work through and, and define how we can do it. I don't know it's our and that's our issue right now. So uh, I'm curious. Uh, what people think. Um, okay, so actually, we're, we're supposed to identify the problem. So perfect, Marzio, that that is one of the problems, the legal um, barriers. Um, I heard you say uh, MTAs um, and data use agreements I would offer in there also. Um, the my, confidentiality, all of that issues, yeah. Yes, yep. Um, my question is, so we have put in place for LungMap and for HubMap uh, a DUA and an MTA uh, that we've signed on to as consortia um, that, that our institutions have found to be sufficient. Um, and within those, uh, we've tried to address, uh, you know, what investigators will or will not do uh, with the data that they're provided with or with the specimens they're provided with. Um, I, I think it would be helpful to understand if those are more widely acceptable. Um, so I, from my repository, for example, I feel that I can share uh, that material. Uh, it's consented for research. Um, we can get into the, the details of the consents. Um, as long as the receiving site uh, 
agrees to the MTA. But I'm curious whether that is, again, acceptable everywhere. Um, so, uh, Maurizio, whether you have taken that approach and what the barriers might be, um, you know, my institution gets them signed pretty quickly, um, but I'm wondering uh, what the case is at other places. I mean, we, we, we don't have experience in that um, broad MTA, I will say like that, in, 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 because like I said, we work uh, investigator uh, based relationships. We don't work with, with a consortium per se. And that will be really interesting to see what is being, what is the, the university approach. And especially in, in these difficult financial times, institutions are really looking for to get something. You know what I mean? They say, okay, you are giving a tissue, but what we are getting back from that? And it, it, it has to be really well addressed and those MTA say, okay, we may get scientific information or we'll get the economical benefit. I, I don't know. That has to be, uh, universities are looking for for ways to, to get something back from the, the effort that they're putting in, in, in those in these bio banks. Scientifically, if we, if we clearly say that any scientific contribution that comes from the use of these samples, will, will we as investigators, we as, uh, uh, as a group, a uh, biobank will get recognized, that is good enough. But it, that has to be well, well addressed there in the MTA. I don't know, because I haven't seen the MTA with, with, with the consortium, but the university always comes to that, those issues. What is, what, is, what will the university will get it in, in compensation of, of those samples? Right, so financial barrier, um, uh, academic recognition, scientific recognition. Um, exactly, how, how, exactly. Yeah, how do we make sure uh, that each institution and really each investigator that contributes is recognized? Exactly. Yeah. Other comments, please? I just have a question, even kind of going back one step, maybe further. You mentioned this a little briefly in like the consent form and getting through the IRB. What is there templated or language uh, about data sharing and biospecimen sharing? Because if you don't have that in on the front end, I'm, I don't know, as we're, we're now trying to navigate this, um, what has been your experience on um, having a true informed consent about that. Yes, that's true. Um, so I, I didn't explain what my, um, what our process is, right? my experience is. So let me, uh, I'll explain that and then uh, others certainly can explain theirs as well. Um, so we have worked uh, for the lung map through the uh, United Network of Organ Sharing, right? For the, through the UNOS. Um, and so through the organ procurement organizations um, and then uh, the referrals through the research recovery organizations. Um, I, I realize uh, that, that there are concerns about tissues that are recovered that way, um, but they, you know, they're, they're good enough for transplant. Uh, we have demonstrated pretty good data coming from them. I don't want to over, overreach here, so uh, I'm going to qualify that is pretty good, uh, but it is good data. Um, so that's the way we've worked. The, the challenge there is that all of the, so there are about 52 organ procurement organizations around the country, um, and each one of them has their own consent form, or it's really an authorization form. Um, and we have, uh, as, as we went into the hub map, we gathered many of those together and looked at them um, and what the, they say. Um, and, and they all say something about research. Some of them say it very generally, you know, that if the tissue is not uh, appropriate for transplant, can't be placed for transplant, that it um, can be placed for research. Um, many of them uh, do address that there'll be no financial remuneration to those who uh, donate or authorize. Um, many of them say there will be clinical information gathered uh, that goes along uh, with the tissue. Um, 
very few of them actually are specific about genetic or genomic research. Um, and uh, so it, it is, uh, and, and many of them actually what they do say is that the materials will be released to investigators who have been vetted, um, you know, so qualified investigators uh, who will do their best to protect privacy and confidentiality of the donor and the, um, the authorizer, the families. Um, for us, our IRB has determined this kind of work because we essentially have a, um, uh, what's it called? The person in between. Um, a, a uh, Oh, shoot. Somebody Intermediary else. or? Uh, yeah, there's a, a word for it. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, but because we don't have direct interaction with any living individual, um, it, it is considered human subjects, uh, non-human subjects research. It's de-identified. So the data is de-identified. Is that what you? Yeah, an honest area? broker. Sorry, the term I was looking okay. for was uh, honest, honest broker. broker. <laughs> yeah, yeah honest sorry. Broker. Yeah. Um, so the research recovery organizations and the organ the OPOs uh, function as that for us. So that the material is de-identified. Um, we then so. Um, there are templates available. Um, I, I've written up one that I'm willing to share um, for that kind of IRB proposal. Does anyone have any experience? So, so we're getting surgical resection right. specimens and endoscopic biopsies. So we are dealing directly with live patients. Um, and some of the data for us is identifiable that we're telling them that we would anything or we're planning to say anything we would share would be de-identified and only by a study participant ID, just trying to think of how that might be different since I guess the people asking for the specimens, it would be de-identified. Um, but for us, it's not. Lori, I'll just add that uh, we had a consent at Hopkins to collect tissue, which we thought was robust. And then we wanted to collaborate with someone and get an MTA. And then the people looked at our consent from the MTA side decided it wasn't good enough for them and it's been a nine month process now to get everything set up. So whatever you're doing with your consent, talk to your MTA people as well okay. early and make sure that they're going to be on the same page for whatever your consent language is to allow you to, to transfer data outside of your institution. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. We, we didn't think of that in advance and that has cost us. Something I will here in, in Pittsburgh, we have a, a different experience in the sense that when we talk about living donor, I mean, a organ donor, transplant, uh, explanted lungs, that is handled by the IRB. But when we have organ donors, it, there's a different institution, it's Cordage. It's here, it's the local institution that, in that case, there's more flexibility about uh, patient information and uh, confidentiality. Because it's somebody who decided to donate organ for transplant, uh, and if they don't go for transplant, they go for research. And uh, they sign a more broad consent form that doesn't go through IRB. And, and that, is, that helps a lot for, for organ donors. It, it's the same that the ones who handle, for example, the uh, the ones who uh, they donate their body for anatomy or anything like that, they, they go from the same road. And, and that helps a lot for, and especially for normal organs that are coming through the, from our procurement, local procurement organization. Uh, and another issue that is being uh, for us challenging is uh, the consent forms, including the the genetic, means where where we go through. Before we were doing our consent form was for histology, what's your blood proteins, all of that. But when we started to do, especially the single cell RNA seq, uh, there was a lot of discussion about how we put that in the consent form, and especially now that everything is going to these big databases and how we handle the consent form is being, uh, we had a lot of discussions with uh, local IRBs, with the core organization. 
uh, organ. And especially we, uh, everybody can be identified by these genetic studies. And it's been a little bit challenging. I don't know how it's experienced in other institutions for, for the genetics. We are working uh, with some of the OPOs to modify their consents to include um, uh, specifically uh, consent or declination of uh, the genomic research and sharing of the genomic data, the potentially identifying genomic data. Um, with, without that, the consensus in the groups that I've been working in um, has been that, that those databases need to be restricted, that, that they need to be controlled access, not open access. Um, so, yep. So many of us are talking about this. Uh, the OPOs are getting the uh, are, are getting the uh, concept, um, and um, for those collecting, especially on living donors, right? Uh, your biopsies and resections. Um, that's going to be particularly important to include. Others with experience, thoughts. How do we do this? Are you having problems in, um, with so much of tissue collection because um, what are the disease types are you covering? I know HCA is focusing on normal cells, but HubMap, I, my understanding is you have a number of diseases that you're covering, right? In this consortium, is it like tissue access like a real problem from patients who are still alive? Because in, in human tumor atlas network, because we are dealing with either uh, you know, precancerous or in situ or tumor samples, it's not so much an issue, um, except for I have, um, in my experience, I have seen that sometimes, like Gloria was saying, when we are collecting information on germline, you know, DNA, then, then there is a lot of um, identification issues and potentially, you know, release of uh, identification becoming a problem and sometimes people are very, uh, you know, careful and cognizant of that. But I mean, tissues are very, I mean, at least in our network, I mean, we have the MTAs and DUAs and all the necessary things in place and IRBs on board and sharing of uh, samples, whether, whether we have a virtual biobank or down the road, a physical biobank of a subset of those samples, I don't think it's much of an issue. So I'm trying to understand that, um, why why is this like so much of a problem in in your case i'll stop there sharmi are you um, saying go ahead no no go ahead D just want to understand sharmi's question so are you saying that in the nci uh world um, that the idea of sharing tissues uh, or sharing genomic sequence is not a problem, has not been a problem, and if so, how do you address it? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, of course, we have to have the the documentation, that, you know, in place, and uh, if if there is no patient consent that was originally, you know. Uh, uh, acquired, then sometimes people have to go back and reconsent the patients. But I have not, I don't think sharing, I mean, we do it, you know, in our consortia, different consortia all the time where if people have MTAs in place, they can, uh, you know, exchange tissue. Sometimes it, it, this kind of collaborations can strengthen a study because you can have, uh, you know, cross site. Uh, validation of a technology in exchanging tissues and sometimes it, it we even have in our H chance you know we have acquired tissues through CHTN and people have um, received like this you know, you know tissues from the same block multiple sites have received it and maybe they're trying out different technologies and even like in our uh, another pancreatic cancer consortium 
that I'm involved in and multiple other social, I mean, as long as we have the patient consent and the IRB and in all the MTAs and DUAs in place, I have not experienced uh, any problems with domestic data sharing. Sometimes acquiring international tissues can be a problem. Like if you're trying to get something from Japan or China, yes. Then we are dealing with an international situation and that could be a problem. But normally in my observation, I haven't seen that um, as a, as a you know, huge problem. So I'm trying to understand, because I don't know much about you know, HubMap or HC at all. I'm trying to understand that in your case, the experience that you have, like, uh, what are the barriers that, that you're facing? Like, you know, what are they about? For example, you That's mentioned the, yeah, no, you mentioned re-consent patient. That's something that in 90% of the cases is quite difficult or impossible. I mean, so that's why we, we we need to come with a really good consent form that uh, that will allow us not only to obtain uh, genetic information, but to share, and not only to share with one or two, not not only a, in in a, in a publication, but to share with the big consortiums and to be analyzed by other investigators that. We may not, we cannot, uh, I mean, will not have control of that. You know what I mean? And uh, and uh, that has to be really well addressed in the consent forms and, and will be good to have kind of a unified consent form that, that will allow the, the easy movement of samples and information between groups that a sample that is being collected in, in Boston can be analyzed in Groningen or in Cambridge and mixed with database of other patients. I mean, that flow needs to be really well addressed in, 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 a, in a consent form, in an MTA, and an IRB protocol. And, and, and those are issues that are important. And especially from now on, is for in our case, it's going to be really complicated to go and Reconsent patients. Right. Reasons. No, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to. I, I'll just quickly add to it, and then I'll let you all discuss. Um, going forward, we know that we are doing, you know, large, uh, big data analysis and things like that. So people are mindful of that going forward. I'm saying that sometimes people are going back and retrospectively maybe analyzing data that from, you know, decades ago or whatever, if they have like an you know, SSE blocks and things like that, sometimes in those cases, maybe the consent was not obtained and if it's still possible to go and obtain, and if not, then we are mindful of what can actually be publicly shared. So in those cases only. I think right now we're faced with uh, needing to be able to keep track of what consent was used for which sample. Um, I, I agree with Maurice if, Maurizio, sorry, um, if, if we can, um, so maybe one of the, the things that we could do an action item uh, would be to share uh, uh, consents, share DUAs, MTAs, uh, have a group that really um, tries to come up with that consent form that we can all agree would give us the, the broadest um, use of the materials um, or so here's a problem right if you write a consent uh, that says uh, we will use your tissue and all the omics data from it and put it in open access people are less likely to consent and so um, can we live with that as a as a scientific group um, that there needs to be some that, that that to get broad donation, we may need to live with having some of the data restricted, uh, that potentially identifying data restricted. Yeah, that, that is a, a good point. And, uh, and important is to come with, okay, uh, what are the limits of, of the sharing? I mean, 
if we go the raw data, we go only analyzed data that can be cannot be modified. Uh, I mean, that that is something that I think has come from the different work, uh, these working groups because what is needed to do the analysis that we want to do, or the other groups want to do. They say, okay, no, with already the process data, we can go and and do the analysis that we think. That would be great, but I, I will be a little bit more concerned to go with the raw data and, and to share with other groups. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, and this, of course, uh, is only more difficult when we're talking about sharing biospecimens. Um, because uh, whatever data, you know, uh, might be generated from those specimens. So I guess the way I see it, we need agreement amongst the investigators also, uh, you know, uh, to strictly adhere to what the providers, the biobanks, say those tissues can be used for. Uh, we have to trust people uh, somewhere along the way uh, here. Uh, can we do that? Yeah. Other uh, comments, like it, try to bring it back to the biospecimens uh, themselves uh, also. Yeah, uh, and then also it's important to unify protocols. Uh, the samples collected in different institutions can, uh, I mean, the data that we're going to generate with the, with the, bio, with the biospecimens are going to be comparable between the ones that are being collected all over the world with our local biobanks. And, and so that's why, I, I don't know, I, I found that a little bit complicated, my experience with other consortiums, when we say, okay, let's share the protocol that we use to, to process the samples. Some people, for some reason, it's not been very helpful in that part. They can feel that that's their own property. You know, well, you know, it makes unique from any other group, but I think it, uh, that can be important. Uh, shall we jump down to subtopic two then for a little bit and talk about protocols and sharing protocols? Uh, Sharmi, do you want to lead that one? Um, no, I mean, uh, it's, it's totally, <laughs> you're the moderator, I was the backup, <laughs> so, you know, it, we can we can handle it jointly maybe. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to what uh, Mauricio was saying it was um, sharing of protocols. Like for um, I know that there are different types of grant mechanisms, but if someone has signed up for uh, a cooperative agreement, you know, then they are kind of bound to to share the protocol with their consortium members. So. And that's what normally what, what we do. We would, uh, going forward, if we are jointly within a consortium, we decide that this is what we are going to do, go forward, say, uh, collect samples prospectively, longitudinally, then the protocols, of course, have to be aligned because otherwise no one will be able to use those uh, biospecimens, you know, down the road for looking for a biomarker or whatever they're looking for. So. Um, I think it makes it a little easier if the grant falls under that kind of category, but just a thought. I'll stop there. Yeah, I had some issues with the internet. I, I, I didn't get it, all the parts, but uh, yes, I mean, in theory, that is what is going to happen. Like I say, this is an experience in, in another consortium that we have in the same cell. And uh, we may say, yes, tomorrow we'll be sending you the protocol. We haven't got it yet. And, uh, and it's been like that. Or, but, but because I think that is really important. That uh, I'm sure we have a protocol that can be improved. But at the moment, we haven't got any other protocol from any other group, and and and, uh, and that is that is important to to have kind of unified or oh, so.
somebody uh, has an improvement in a protocol that I don't know that is better to uh, for the sample to go for Takara and Isik or something like that and say okay from now on, instead uh, instead of the frozen media that you guys use use this one I mean to be sharing about that information with us that would be really good. Sometimes that, that information is shared at, at different levels, but not sometimes we does that we are collecting the samples. Is my so there are efforts um, to share protocols in a um, more organized way, in a more uniform way. So um, HubMap, for example, um, has identified protocols.io uh, as a place that protocols can and should be shared. Um, speaking um, for myself, uh, so uh, yes, we want to share our protocols. There is a bit of a hurdle um, to getting into protocols.io. There is a cost. It's a small cost. Uh, I still haven't figured out uh, quite how much it does cost. Um, it's a commercial um, endeavor. Um, so I'm wondering what other people might be using. I mean, sharing protocols by email, the versions change, you know, you, you find something new and that it changes and the person you share the protocol with doesn't know that. So that um, I guess I would put out a plea that it, it would be best to share them in a common place and, um, you know, to, to um, do version control in that place. Um, but I, I am wondering what other people are finding either with protocols.io or uh, if there are other solutions. I'll quickly add to this. Um, Gloria, I know that uh, HCAN also uses protocols.io. And uh, sometimes, um, so a lot of the protocols, as you know, can be you know, put there, they can be edited, they can be shared and given rights to people, you know who you want to share with and all that. But I was also thinking about um, like within this network where we have multiple consortia coming together, do we want to do anything differently or do we want to use the, uh, I think nature also has an open um, access for the protocols. I think it's called protocol exchange. There are other, other places like Jove and, you know, I'm just, Thing. There, are, there are other places people can go also, right? So, so what would be the, we can share our experience and what would be the best way to, for us to unify the, the, the three consortia you know, together because I think we are also thinking about the larger picture is to have like a cross consortia collaborative project, right? So um, yeah, I'll stop there. Hello, this is Sebastian from UCSD. I was wondering one thing related to protocols, if there is like, I think it's great to share protocols, but on the other hand, I was wondering how to evaluate these protocols and really to what will be like the, 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 the QC measurement to um, say, okay, this or that way is, is better for this or that uh, downstream assay. And if there are like efforts, if there's kind of like a cross consortia, someone who is in charge to like kind of kind of do cross comparison of these protocols. Exactly. That was, and especially now that, for example, we are doing adding not only single salary seek but taxi, and we are doing a metal metabolomics, proteomics. Maybe there are protocols that are good for this part, but good for other things. And, and we may come with two or three protocols to process the samples, thinking ahead of what they may be going to be used. But we need to have feedback, everybody and say, okay, for proteomics, this one works better, but for metabolomics, this one is going to be, but it, it, it has to be very dynamic, very cross talk between the different groups the people who's analyzing analyzing the samples and the people who's collecting the samples and say, look, this is what is our experience is showing that this is better than the other for this particular type of experiment. And we may end it with two or three protocols or that need to be used to, to collect and to preserve the samples. Yeah, 
is, is what I think is happening, where we are going right now. I don't have a lot of experience with protocols.io yet um, or, or any of the other uh, joint ones, but, but that is one of the theoretical um, advantages, as I understand it, is, is there is an opportunity to comment back on somebody else's protocol um, or, you know, to, uh, to ask questions about somebody else's protocol. Um, does anyone else have more experience with that or uh, with other protocol repositories, how that works? I think one thing, this is Sharmishta, I think one thing that as a, a consortium or a consortium of consortia we can also do is to validate these protocols. So if someone has developed a protocol, you know, that, that's the, the beauty of having this kind of very close-knit networks and someone else can test those protocols and sometimes and that, that's how you can you can make sure that, that that's a way of like um, handling the QC part of these protocols too before it goes on a on a in a public domain or is widely shared or is published or uh, I think uh, Sebastian was making that point right to have a how do you know that this works and that could be one way of testing each other's uh, protocols to make sure that it's working. Um, Maybe one one you know protocol and one way of doing things works best on lung cancer uh, or lung tissues, but not on other tissues. And that also something uh, as a, as a consortium that people can figure out. And uh, those can be also mini projects that can be developed within different consortia. That that's my thought. So it seems like maybe we need people to volunteer to come together to do that, right? To uh, evaluate protocols. Uh, maybe the protocols need to be available first uh, in a common place. Um, those two priorities to get the protocols gathered and then people to evaluate them. Hi all, this is Jeff Woodsett, just following in you know, quietly back here. Thanks um, Jeff. Uh, Sebastian, absolutely um, feedback, I guess, and uh, feedback from us to you guys. Uh, your protocol worked great uh, for us uh, on NukeSeq, but we don't have uh, a standardized way of getting you know, that information back. And we're so segmented, the guys who isolate the cells who then do the RNA, uh, single nuke or, and then the RNA are separate from the work uh, group that is doing the informatics and then a month later, we get together and say, oh, it did work. It, by that time, we've really lost track of, of that protocol and, uh, and the feedback that says, uh, this is how we modified it. And so, so a place, a chat room, and commitment to update those, uh, those changes and uh, the, the appreciation that comes with sharing protocols uh, is also really important. <laughs> So, so, so what we're trying to do at the Center for Epigenomics at UCSD, we, we plan to have like a, like a protocols IO kind of like account um, where we will put up all our protocols that we used and link to, to actual data and um, so that people can also evaluate what came out of it and link to, to publications. So just validated protocols in that sense. And uh, we haven't done that yet, so we're currently compiling that, but the goal is to share it as publicly as possible. But that's more from our experimental side, it's not a tissue collection. I, I think we're working toward the same thing, uh, but for mm -hmm. tissue collection. Um, I, I heard Sharmi say, uh, and others have suggested that, that a, uh, a NIH, I'll say, um, supported and run uh, protocol deposition um, system is in development, but, but from what I've heard, it's in development. Um, and so maybe as a consortia, consortia of consortias, we really should make this decision uh, of what we're going to use for now. Uh, and perhaps then we can move from there if something uh, less commercial develops. 
uh, that, that would be my suggestion at the moment. Um, again, anyone with experience with protocols.io, I'd really like to hear more from them. Um, I, I also actually, uh, so hopefully somebody will answer that uh, comment in just a moment, uh, but after that, we're going to take a break. We're supposed to take our 15 minute break and uh, then we'll be back for 75 minutes to, uh, to have more discussion along these lines. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to quickly add that I am not aware of um, the protocol deposition system within NIA. I was wondering if we would like to develop one as, as a you know, trans consortium effort. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I know that was a short break. Um, I also uh, took the liberty of um, copying the blue box at, at least once here, and we can do it again. But in the first section, I think we had two major topics um, that came out of the discussion. One was overcoming the legal and institutional um, barriers to share, sharing tissues and potentially identifying data. Um, and the other was, uh, uh, and, and I guess that would be cross consortial is the idea. Um, and then the second is the cross consortial sharing of protocols and feedback on protocols. Um, so now our task is to try to uh, really frame, um, just like we do a hypothesis that we can test, right? frame a problem that we feel we can solve by collaborating across the consortia, um, making recommendations about what we want to do, um, who else might we need in a group to, um, uh, to follow through on those recommendations um, and what more specifically either in meeting um, as a group um, or in saying that we will tackle uh, and then bring back to the group um, uh, and that's what we would put in the our next meeting is uh, component of the blue boxes so Gloria, you, you put yourself on mute somehow. I am so sorry. That happens when you click on the Google Doc and then you use the space bar. It doesn't work because you're not on the Zoom. So uh, I'm sorry. I was freaking out. I thought it was me. I don't know how <laughs> long I, I was traveling it. on there uh, <laughs> with no one being able to hear me. So I apologize. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's all. There's only 10 seconds. Oh, it's a <laughs> uh, so I was talking about the blue boxes. How far did I get? Uh, you were saying we should put information in the blue boxes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, if you look at the blue boxes, I copied them over. So there's two of them. Um, one focusing on legal and institutional barriers, sharing tissues, and the other one on uh, where or how to share protocols and feedback on protocols. Uh, you can all see the various sections of those blue boxes, so I'm not going to um, I'm not going to say what I said before. Please fill in your names, uh, and if you don't mind being contacted, your email addresses. Um, easiest to do that, just each one of us uh, adding. So, so should we tackle the first one? Um, in the first part of our discussions, we threw out a lot of ideas about what we've all either been doing or what we've been faced with. So now, uh, can we be more concrete about what are the problems um, and recommendations for solving them? And can I sort of leave that off with a question? This is the HCA and Hub Map together in one meeting, which I think is this the first time the two groups have supposed to be together? And if so, it seems like the same protocol that should exist in both to collect tissues for the research purposes, and so. How much cross interaction has there been between HubMap and HCA in, in these protocols in collecting tissue? Like this seems to be the ideal opportunity. And I see there's seven people in this room uh, talking about this. I'm certainly not the right person to be asking or I'm not that involved in either of these two things. But how do we integrate the two sides so that we have the best harvesting protocols going forward by having this crosstalk?
You're on mute again, Gloria. Sorry <laughs> to clarify. This is a meeting of multiple consortia. Um, so not just HubMap and HCA, but, uh, but LungMap and HTN and uh, the kidney collaboratives, um, et cetera. So it, it really is trying to be very cross consortial. Um, and as you said, we are all trying to solve these problems in our own cluster, uh, but this is an attempt to broaden it. One more clarification is that I think with it, my experience is that within each one of those consortia, as technology is changing, we're also identifying how protocols ought, to, which protocols work and, and how protocols might be uh, modified to work better for the new and multiple technologies. Um, so I, I will be quiet now. Um, others can add their thoughts about that, please. Hi, Gloria. This is Jeff again. You're hearing me? Oh, good. Um, our problem, we have very rare patients uh, with very small biopsies, and it would be lovely to have the best protocol um, and to be able to share that tissue to others who have uh, other protocols, for example, proteomics, lipidomics on the same sample. The pathology department has its own um, embargo on being able to share tissues that we've never really gotten through. And some of our collaborating um, partners in LungMap have the same uh, embargo that they can't share uh, pathological tissues, even when we have consent. Um, these, were also, these, these children will also be very identifiable. They're rare. Uh, disorders and they will have um, specific uh, mutations uh, that will be identified either in publications when we have consent or would be identifiable and therefore families identifiable. So we haven't, you know, we've discussed this, but we really haven't uh, dealt with it. Um, so there's the problem. <laughs> Is there a cross consortia way of handling an IRB? to be able to communicate with IRB, the other, and when we send the sample to the collaborating institutions, they have their own uh, concerns. So it's become such a snafu that it's holding back our, our ability to do uh, research. So there's a problem. Can, can, how do we solve that one? <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. There are two issues. I mean, it's when when we use uh, disease samples from uh, uh, biopsies or explanted organs, that's a different piece. It, we compare with normal samples. For normal samples, there's more flexibility. There's usually in our case we have large amount of tissue, basically the two lungs. The whole two lungs for 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 the biobank, and where we can uh, uh, collect everything that we wanted. Also, there's more flexibility about patient information, patient confidentiality, because okay, in this case it says it's a disease, it's an organ donor. But when we go with a with a living donor coming from that means from a, a biopsy or or a explanted tissue, the size of the sample it dramatically reduced to, uh, uh, we're lucky, to an inch of tissue. And uh, there are more issues that we need to handle from the legal point of view. And, and, and it's always, and, and it make a little bit more complicated to share those samples. I completely agree. Excellent. And I'll add that, you know, in the United States, this really goes to the level of regulations, just federal regulations on what we're allowed to do, which become more and more challenging. Seems like every time they make a revision to uh, HIPAA or, or what they tell the IRBs we're allowed to do. And I really think the only way to push back is for the scientific community to work with ethicists and government regulators on tweaking these things to allow research to go forward uh, 
looking at the risk reward of doing research because uh, I, I, for example, I was meeting with uh, the higher tier people at Johns Hopkins talking about having a general consent that everybody who walks in the door basically is allowed to consent to give tissue or blood on any project, a generalizable consent. And they described all the federal regulations that would prevent us from being able to do something like that. And it seems like we can't fix these problems one institution at a time. We need to work with the powers that be to, uh, to explain to them why we need these rules adjusted so that we can do research in a more beneficial way for humanity. And I don't know how to get there, but that's probably where we need to do that. One institution at a time is not really going to fix the problems. What about taking NIH to take the leadership in that position? I mean, that's a federal institution. They know more the public. They're more involved in, in all of that. And, and they, we look for, for the NIH to some guidance in that. It means what are the new rules? What are the new limitations? I know that there are countries that samples cannot be sent or we cannot receive. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that maybe an AH can help us, I don't know, uh, as a, as a government institution. I don't know. It's just a question more than, than anything else. I mean, this, this is also something we can put forth to the, to the larger group, right? This is a question for, you know, I mean, NIH is not a regulatory agency, so, but we do work with, you know, people, and um, I'm not directly involved in that, but, you know, is this something where uh, we, are, we are facilitators? So is this something that we should bring forward to the larger group and see how we can help? Even, even get the conversation started, like how to get around this, you know, bureaucratic um, hurdles and uh, make it a little easier for, for people. That, that's my opinion. Yeah, because it, 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 even every time that we publish something, and, and a single solar basic data or even a bulk RNA data. We have to get, transfer the data to NIH almost for public sharing with other groups or not. Is what I understand. And uh, we do that because, okay, it's, it's normal, but I suppose NIH needs to know a little bit more about the sharing of that information and from the same time the sample and, and all of that. That's why I was thinking about you guys have kind of give us some guidance how to do that and what are the limitations and what we can do. I, I think, I, you know, we at NIH, at least I can, I can speak for myself, I think we share a lot of your frustration as well, but we can only, um, you know, request, like even under our grant mechanism, you know, we, we make the request and we hope people will comply, but we cannot let go to different institutions and impose like government rules. Uh, so it, it becomes a little harder for, I think, for us also. But, uh, you know, we can, we can try and see if, there, if there's any way to, to make this problem so, you know, go away or at least a little easier. But I know that a lot of the times we also have that issue because institutions have their own policies and uh, I think as Mark said that you know one institution uh, you know we cannot solve these issues one institution at a time that's true but there's also so much we can do and not every study that's conduct being conducted sometimes it gets very complicated because the patient issues go in different directions for different studies and the government can only intervene with what we are funding. So there are like different layers of complexity that even we face. So, but it, it's, a, it's a very good point and we can, we can see how, um, you know, we can discuss and help. I'll, I'll stop there. Gloria, if you're talking, you're on mute again. Sorry. Okay. I have to go stop going back and forth. My sense is, uh, what I was trying to say is, my sense is that if we as a consortia or as a consortia of consortia come up with, uh, let's say, a 
consent document that we all agree on that covers the concerns that we've just raised. And we took that to the NIH. We took it to um, you know, the leaders of the various consortia that, that we could then get um, uh, the, the blessing, let's say, uh, of the NIH, which helps our IRBs to accept those documents, right? So our IRBs are often looked to the regulations, um, but the regulations are based on recommendations. So I, I, what do others see it that way, that uh, if we got together and developed a common uh, consent form, a common authorization form, uh, and it probably would differ depending on whether we're talking about donations of whole organs or we're talking about biopsies um, that would move us forward. I think that would help. Am I unmuted? Go ahead. Oh, you were okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have compliance at several levels in our in our IRB. The IRB has the proposal, but then the um, overview of the institution and in, in legal looks at those as well, and they haven't been able to um, find equipoise. So, you know, an agreed document that uh, had really been vetted by consortia as well as by the NIH might be very helpful at this point because we go, we're going in circles in our own IRB and it's a fairly good IRB. Uh, it's sensible, but it goes in to compliance, to legal, and then it goes back and they say, and we just can't get there. So I, I would make that recommendation. Yeah. The I don't other know if the will take that on though. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeff, what did you say? I don't know if the NIH will take that on. Uh, who has the leadership who, who would really be able to push that through? Good recommendation anyway. I guess uh, I'm thinking that it's ours to start with. Yeah. Yeah. We really thought, thought it all through carefully and put a good document together. It would be worth doing. And it will be good, the, the NIH, in the sense that in some way, uh, I don't know, depending on the protocols of each institution, NIH in some way support those samples. You know? Sometimes, sometimes there are groups that they, their own institutions support the biobank. Sometimes there are institutions that that get money from NIH through these core facilities. I mean, there. That way, I think it's really important to have the NIH involved and help us to, to, to kind of get them uh, their their position and 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 kind of like you were saying, the blessing of NIH about uh, one consent form. One, uh, because I think they are directly involved in the process of of collecting uh, the samples. Maybe not physically, but uh, sometimes supporting economically the collection of those. Yeah. So are there, are there people on this call that um, would like to be involved in a effort to do this? So I, I'll volunteer because um, I actually um, do have a charge to do this through the hub map. Yeah. I've been working a little bit with, not a little bit, I've been working with the uh, research recovery organizations to try to come to something that we can agree on. I would certainly be happy to help. This is Jeff again. Thanks. We need that for lung map and uh, our own pathologist, Catherine Wickenheiser, I'm sure would, would be glad to be engaged. Right. Yeah, happy to help also. You just put your names in maybe uh, under our next meeting or, or something like that. That'd be good. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Okay. I guess we're sort of talking about a, a cross consortia of policy group, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. Other comments, shall we move on? We've got about 20 minutes now. Um, any other comments on the sharing of organs and tissues? It, it sounds like we need to tackle this before we can really uh, tackle the database question or the sharing of um, RNA-seq libraries. Um, okay. So, so sorry, where, where we need to put our name? I was trying to look in the document. Uh, yep. Um, so we have other group members, but for the request that I just put out, um, maybe under our next meeting is and who that would be, our next, uh, who would be working on this. Um, and then uh, if you have thoughts about additional expertise, if you know people, ethicists perhaps, or you know people who have been putting thought into these uh, problems, uh, maybe you could add that to the blue box as well. It, it, maybe you need to ask them first, but um, give us some that, There's seven people in this group, but I'm sure yes. if you were to make an announcement in the wider group to, to talk about this, you would have a lot of people raise their hands. They'd want to get involved. And maybe some people who, who aren't in this group of seven, but who are already engaged in these sort of processes to really accelerate this uh, beyond our shared expertise. I have no expertise, but you, you all may have some. Uh, you're right, Mark, uh, which means um, one of us and should make a <laughs> should volunteer to do one of those two minute uh, wrap ups, right? So um, I can do that. I'll put that out there. I think this is important enough. Um, we should do this. Okay. Shall we go on to the protocols uh, question there? Then sharing of protocols and feedback on protocols. So I see there are problems we think we can solved by collaborate. Oh, let me just go back. Sorry, uh, I jump all over the place. To the sharing of tissues and uh, Jeff, your, your point, which is a really good one about it's one thing to share normal uh, because it's hard to sort out, you know, out of the vast numbers of normals or near normals, who's who. Yeah. Um, but when you have a rare disease that becomes, uh, you know, more of a problem. So I, I guess the, the, the thought is that if we're working cross consortia, that that's one way to kind of increase the end of these rare diseases, um, mm -hmm. right, knowing that they're rare enough that even that may not be good enough. But, but uh, that is one of the reasons why course, cross consortia work, you know, kind of hides the individuality uh, where, where the sample came from, um, you know, that would lead lead you back to the individual so that's just a plea that not only are we sharing um, normal uh, and HubMap is is challenged right now to be normal um, not disease but I don't think it'll take long um, yeah so one of the reasons to work cross consortia is to increase the numbers of uh, of everything okay now let's uh, go back to protocols if you don't mind um, so I see problems we think we can share, uh, that we can solve is sharing of protocols, uh, feedback on protocols, and uh, QC and validation of protocols. Um, recommendations on how we do that? Yeah, I guess one way is that each of the uh, consortia develop uh, an updated uh, site for all protocols. Um, in LungMap, for any data we post on LGA, we have our protocol there, but the detailed protocols, um, the real subtleties of um, you know, single nuke seek and attack seek combined, et cetera, and how they continue to morph, um, each consortia could do it. And then maybe a common place that someone hosts the uh, findings from each of the different consortia, HubMap and uh, LungMap. And, and, uh, 
see the eye. Jeff, do you have any experience with um, protocols.io? No, I don't. I don't. Uh, Fiona Griffin had put in the group chat that she can connect us with Lenny uh, Teitelman, uh, co-founder of Protocols.io. When I was at the um, uh, Chan Zuckerberg kickoff meeting this summer, Lenny was there at the meeting. And I don't know the relationship between CZI and Protocols.io, but I think they funded him. And I think he was allowing CZI members free publication of their protocols there. So there may be some way that this could all come together uh, using protocols.io. It is certainly a, a very useful site. Uh, I've looked at it several times for opportunities. Mark, do you contribute to it? No, I have not yet. Yeah. Uh, but we have one protocol we're working on right now, which when we get to the end, we will probably put it in there. Yeah, yeah there are. Um... There are some institutions that have an institution-wide uh, accessibility to protocols.io. Um, but I don't know that other, I, I don't know what the cost of that is. I don't know, um, you know, what other institutions are doing. Uh, I'd, I'd like to suggest that we need a champion uh, for this. We need someone that could lead a group, a cross consortia group, um, to identify a central place where protocols. So we're really talking about uh, standard operating procedures, right? SOPs. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I, I guess I would also maybe encourage people not to feel like it has to be the be all end all protocol. Um, that this is a challenge, right? We all uh, we don't we don't want egg on our face. We don't want um, you know to put out things before we're really comfortable with them. But that is the best way to get uh, feedback and to get things uh, moved along more quickly. These are all things that are easy for me to say. I think they're harder uh, to do. Um, just trying to put the ideal out there. Um, yeah. Certainly in LungMap Consortium, we would be able to do something like that, have someone assigned to just be responsible for all protocols and getting them on. If we had a common website like that, HIO, that would be great. And so, so maybe could we make the recommendation that each of the consortia that are involved in this uh, multi-consortia meeting identify a person who's responsible for that uh, consortia? Collecting and moving our protocols uh, and SOPs through you know, yep. to a common place. Yep. I think that would be really good. So I'll bring this forward on the two minute uh, mm -hmm. talk as well. <clears throat> but so, so I am a little afraid that we'll put this, uh, the, both of these things out and it will be silence. Um, so <laughs> if it's, if it's not the seven of us on the, on the call, um, but you know, someone else uh, in your consortia uh, and you'd like to volunteer them, <laughs> uh, talk to them and, and mm -hmm. get them to, uh, to step up would be great. Are there barriers to sharing protocols? I don't think so. It, it, just proprietary stuff, but my goodness, we're all being funded um, by the by people. And from my point of view and long map point of view, everything's absolutely open and shareable. Others? No, I, I agree. I agree that, I mean, like I was saying before, a lot of these, the collection of the samples are supported by NIH sometimes. And it, it, we, that means it, it belongs to, to, to all of us. And at the end of the benefit for, the, for, for what we do for patients, for the people is to, to share the protocol. 
yeah, to those of us that are uh, are putting our time and effort into this, it seems like the right thing to do, right? Uh, let me play devil's advocate just for a minute. Uh, so we have an NIH representative uh, on on here. So the devil's advocate says though that so I'm funded for these five years, um, and then it goes back up for comp or for a year. Uh, some of the commitments are only a, a year of funding. Um, goes back up for competition and um, with peer review, I'm no longer the one who's funded to do the work, but it has now gone to someone else. Um, I, I do think people are uncomfortable perhaps about sharing and, and Mauricio, you mentioned it before, you know, needing, needing to um, have some assurance that there's academic, scientific, financial, recognition of what has been shared. Um, be, because if, if, you, if there isn't, then you're kind of left out in the cold the next time the review cycle comes through. So uh, I put that out there for comment and are there any solutions to that concern? Yeah. Um, this is this Shami. So I, I, I think this is a discussion that at least in, in the group that I'm part of, which is the Cancer Biomarkers Research Group of Division of Cancer Prevention, it came up like many years ago and it was very hard to at first change the, the mindset where people come with, you know, where you do your R01 study and they're not willing to share and you're not willing to do that. And then we have a network, uh, it's called the Early Detection Research Network, which started to, uh, which emphasized heavily on collaboration and how you can benefit from collaboration, whether it's increasing the end for your study, like, you know, if it's, a, and we deal with sometimes maybe not as rare as Jeff was saying, but things like pancreatic cancer, where it's very hard to get early stage cancers or, you know, panin lesions, immediate precursor to pancreatic cancer and coming together, how people can benefit and get something done. And I think, I think that consortium probably laid the foundation to uh, how people can come together, collaborate, and not bring that I don't want to share kind of, you know, mindset. And eventually they, they realize that they're actually benefiting from it. You know, they get more grants, they get more, you know, uh, f financial support, whether it's through NIH or through other, they get recognition, they, they get things done for the field. And it's very hard to move, you know, a translational field forward, you know, one team at a time. So it's very important that people come together and we emphasize that a lot. And yes, there, there could be resistance, like you're saying, Gloria, that what, what, what is it in, in it for me? But then once people uh, develop this kind of you know, collaboration and a lot of junior investigators, they, they observe this and they learn from this and it helps them in their career, you know, how you come together and, and do team science instead of you know, individual science and then, then uh, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I think I think people can bring that mindset, but it's not something that cannot be changed. And uh, particularly when they when they recognize the benefit of it, and uh, that that's just my from my observation, I can say that yeah, it, it is a difficult thing. But I think uh, how you know, even for, you know, success in like study sections and with your grants, I think people also recognize that these days more that there has been a team science effort instead of who has been the first author and who took all the credit for this, you know, that kind of stuff that, you know, we're kind of used to historically. So that's just my two cents. Anybody else have two cents to add to the pot? We have just a couple of minutes here. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, when we have 50% uh, success and, and grants, sometimes you have a large volume of samples as your range against other people. And uh, that's why sometimes people don't like to share uh, samples. 
and that I have seen that before. Yeah. Right. That's why I mean, if we, if this is born, or all of these, it's very inclusive, and, and we learn that this is really a benefit to all of us. I, I think it, it, it's important to to create that set of mind in, in all of us, that this is a sharing consortium that at the end is going to benefit all of that, depending on one particular application or whatever. Agreed. Times have changed uh, and uh, it's good to see the adaptations actually. Um, I, I think we just need to, um, you know, be mindful of them and uh, and educate and remind each other uh, about how important it is. So sorry. How important it is and, and how much benefit there is uh, to the open sharing uh, of ideas, knowledge, experience, etc. Okay, I really appreciate everyone contributions here. Uh, Lori, we didn't hear very much from you. Uh, I hope that you add your thoughts to the document if you don't, uh, didn't feel comfortable speaking up. Um, and that goes for everyone else uh, on the call. Uh, I will talk with you all. We will talk with each other later.